Victorian age. I consider this to be the golden age of England. This is the, the biggest, the most powerful that they ever are, okay, that, that we see. Um, the world stage, when it was talking about uh, Victoria and her empire there on that page. Um, you know, it's not a coincidence that, you know, the Victorian age is named after her. Um, you know, the lake, Canada, you know, the, a realm of, of uh, England and so on. Very, very prominent uh, woman ruler. Um, along with Elizabeth I, probably the most important. Um, what, was, what was the stat that at one point... How much of the population? One quarter. I was going to say a third, so I was off. One quarter of the population of the world was underneath their control. And it's not a military control. It's not Big Brother, okay? Um, as we see in here, you know, it was more through their business, through their, you know, their economy and so on uh, elsewhere as opposed to military conquest. Um, and they put their presence in, uh, in their area like uh, India and so on. And we'll, we'll talk about that um, later on. Um, but this is the golden age of their power. Well, when people have power, they're afraid to lose the power. Um, with these guys, it's not, I don't necessarily sense that it's a fear. Um, however, they take some huge hits. And the hits don't come until the modern with World War I, um, the Great War is what they refer to it, and then ultimately World War II. Um, when you think of Britain now, do you think of a superpower? Uh, no, not, not even close. Okay, But in the 1800s, they were a superpower, if not the superpower. Okay, they were large and they were in charge. Okay, they had a lot of growth, industry, population. We talked about the Industrial Revolution in the Romantic eras. Okay, so now that we are in the 1800s, uh, early to mid, this is the Charles Dickens era. This is the England that you might have thought about when we talked about British literature. This is the Sherlock Holmes. Okay, Oliver, you know, all of those different things that you're envisioning in your mind. This is this time period. Okay, it's a lot closer to us than, you know, the Renaissance. It's hard to really, them with those, the lacy doilies, you know, and their clothes. And this is more like what we see. This is Sweeney Todd. This is all of these, these elements. Um, that, this is it. The Golden Age. Um, so keep that in mind. The technological advances at the bottom of the page there. Um, up until this point, anybody that traveled, it was the horse-drawn carriage, maybe a sailboat. Those don't, you know, th those are, a, you know, a, a finite. There's a, a this, there, there's a certain speed, and you, not everybody can afford it or maintain that speed. But then we get the steam engine, steam-powered boats, mass transit starts to pick up, and we can move a lot of people around. And mostly, the most important part is cheaply. Um, there's a stat in the book here that talks about, you know, the population throughout the, this period, you know, doubles, okay? Well, when the, the area here doesn't, you know, what if we doubled the amount of students in this school? Would you notice that? Yeah, where? Well, you would notice that in the hallways. You'd probably notice that in the bathrooms. Can you imagine what that would look like? You'd notice it in the classrooms. Where else? Food, cafeteria. What if our food rations don't change? Some people are gonna go hungry? Yeah. Okay. Um, so kind of think about how throwing in a double, you know, what about the jobs? What about if you had to fight against, it's hard to fight against you guys now for jobs, but what about if there were extra? You double a population. What would that do for you? And so you can see the struggle that they would have. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, electricity, you know, made streets safer. Uh, theatrical performances could be more thrilling at this point. Um, so we see this starting to, to really build up. They talk about canned food, um, you know, help feed people and feed soldiers, keep that going. Um, what was the last? Phot photographs are starting to come about during this time period. Because remember, we, uh, our Civil War in America was in the 1860s. You know, we have some photographs from that time period. And if you look at the years of the Victorian age, 1837 to 1900, okay, our Civil War is in the middle of this era. And we had pictures. And so now we have some, uh, really the first uh, pictures, this first era that we can have concrete document, uh, you know, documented visuals. Otherwise, we just had little sketches in the past, in the Renaissance, maybe a painting here and there. Um, so we see a big difference, a big change. Um, <clears throat> Marxism and Darwinism, two of the bigger names of this era. 
we, we were introduced to Marx when we were in 1984. We had some presentations about uh, uh, you know, communists and so on. Um, he was a big, um, a big radical and so on. You can see that he was bar kicked out of a city for it um, and so on. Um, his, he, he said that on the next page there, that all class warfare was inevitable. According to Marx, all property and the means of production should be held in common and all means of substance should be shared out equally. What do we call this? Socialism. Okay? So he was a big proponent of that. We heard about him a lot in the news, mainly with uh, Obama and his health care. The debate surrounding that, what, a year ago? And change, and even nowadays. Okay? So if you heard the term Marxism or Marxist, okay? They're not necessarily calling him a commie or anything, but they're talking about the, the illusion back here to what his belief is that everybody should share. We should all work. 40 hours a week, and we should all be fed, we should all share, you know, not necessarily hand-me-down clothes, but we should all be equals. Does that have some sort of credibility? Does that, well, that sounds okay, doesn't it? But then you're like, well, I work harder than them. Why should that, you know, the, then you get in the debate, well, you know, the, the class structure and so on. And that, that was his argument. That's a radical viewpoint. And that's why he was banned from certain places. Okay, and that's why he's still controversial now. And the last person, Darwin, we've all heard of him, mainly it's because of his theories pertaining to evolution. Okay, um, we see the seeds of discontent uh, uh, towards religion, <coughs> excuse me, in the earlier centuries when people are starting to, remember, remember the humanism movement? Taking, you know, praising humans, not so much praising God. Look at what great things humans can do. They're not slamming God. But yet they are keeping, you know, look how great we are. What wonderful things we can do. And those were the seeds of discontent within religion during, uh, you know, back a few hundred years there. And now we come up to Darwin, um, who through his, uh, his book, The Origins of Species, which was 150 years, a couple years ago, um, is that everybody from pine trees and, what was it, and codfish to human beings, they're governed by the same natural laws. And then it came out with evolution. And I doubt that when he printed it, he thought he was going to create the, the huge debate that's going on now. You know, creationism versus evolution and so on. Um, but it, it's something that is uh, definitely, definitely applicable uh, nowadays. Um, <clears throat> so very, very famous individuals in this time period that are still referenced today, Karl Marx and Darwin. Um, big idea one, talking about the Victorian values and so on. Uh, three of the most typical Victorian ideals were self-improvement, moral earnestness, and the value of work. And you'll see how that is played out through you know, their growth and development and the stuff we've talked about. I'm talking about the middle class public there at the bottom. Okay, um, Making something of oneself required guidance and effort. Um, we have a big struggle of classes in this time period. And we'll read some things um, that really uh, portray a class structure society. In the novel 1984, when Winston was talking to the old man, remember the old parole? Now that wasn't into the 1800s, but it was showing you that even in 1940s, or whenever it was supposed to be, probably 40s, it was the structured. It was still, we had to get off the street so that the higher class guy with the hat can walk by and tip him and governor and all of that stuff. Um, and so it was very, uh, it, it was relevant there, but the seeds of that were planted in, in these other generations as well. Um, if you've seen the musical My Fair Lady, okay, the whole premise of that, or Bernard Shaw's uh, Pygmalion play, um, you know, upper echelon psychiatrist, speech therapist makes a bet with his buddy that, hey, I can take any person and, and make them pass them off as a, you know, as a high class woman. Okay, we have that nowadays in your teen comedies, right? You take an ugly duckling and turn him into a homecoming queen, right? Isn't that the premise? This is, you know, this is the same thing. Um, and so we see the class structure. So they take in the movie, it's, it's Audrey Hepburn, a famous, famous actress. And she can barely speak. She has this real cockney accent, and it's just really rough and raw. And they have to teach, you know, the rain in Spain stays mainly in the plain. You might have heard of that. But um, it, it's one of those elements that really exemplifies the differences in class structure 
um, and in society. And it's, it's one that's uh, definitely a, um, a, a must-see for those of you who like musical theater. Um, democracy, um, page 914. The expansion of democracy as England expands their, um, you know, their their uh, their control over various countries, they expand their government um, and so on. Even nowadays, there are still commonwealths of, um, you know, Australia. Um, uh, I don't know if New Zealand is still it mentions that in there. I don't know if they succeeded or not. Um, but there was an article about, uh, you know, with uh, William's marriage to Catherine. Is that this year? This was, was it, it was April, I believe. Um, you know, that it wasn't just England. This was a worldwide affair. We were interested in America, just really for the reality TV aspect of it. Uh, but there were other places around the world, countries that are commonwealths of Britain. And it was huge, huge news, more so than here, okay, for different reasons. Um, and so they still are spread out. They're just not nearly the power uh, that they were at one point. Um, you can see with the role of democracy, the things changing. Um, you know, with the, the, the idea and beliefs of all of these different theories and, and cultures and, and uh, um, you know, social you know, judgments being passed, um, you know, the democracy didn't necessarily change so much. While the culture changed, democracy was still kind of doing the same thing. And that caused some, uh, some, uh, some discomfort at times. And it goes into greater detail there. Um, but I don't need to read that to you. On uh, the next big idea, too, the emergence of realism. <clears throat> the belief sprouted during this time period that a nation of individuals free to pursue their own economic self-interest without government interference, it would ultimately produce a stronger, wealthier nation. Um, so a lot of people who believe in free trade and free markets, um, you know, doing, you, government, just stop regulating me, stop, you leave me alone and I will be fine. And the belief here is that without government control and individuals being able to do and pursue what they want, that they're able to uh, produce stronger products, stronger nation, uh, ultimately. Um, and as you see, this was a belief that was, you know, widely uh, thought of during this particular time period. Um, Voices of reform on the right side there. Um, you know, people starting to speak up for what they want. Um, you know, people, you know, in the past you speak up and things could happen to you. Um, you see one of the things that sprouted up was the YMCA was founded during this time period. Um, you know, some other, you know, people being able to petition and, and uh, you know, get their, their beliefs and get their ideas and get their voices heard. Um, and they were, they, it was really starting to sprout and, um, you know, take flight during this time period. Um, the novel, the very bottom here, um, just like in the Renaissance period, we had the sonnets. Those were kind of the main contribution of that time period in poetry. Here, this time period, it's the novel. I took a course in college called The History of the English Novel. Oh, semester long. Every novel was five or six hundred pages. It was rough. Um, I was working third shift at the time. I don't think, I, I'm going to share this with you, I don't think I finished a single book. I started them. I probably read 400 of the 600 pages. I paid attention. All the tests were, um, you know, essay tests, so I was able to do well and I could participate in discussions, but there was just too much reading and I just, I had to sleep because I had to go to work and so on. Um, but it was a really dry class. Um, dry boring, hard to, to follow. I probably have a better appreciation of it now since I've taught English literature for so long. Um, but the novel, okay? And Dickens, um, you know, this was a man who, who really wrote in serials, who wrote, he got paid per page. And so they write these long books because then they take a chapter and then they put it in a journal or publication. So then the next month, if you want to continue the story, you got to buy that magazine again and there's chapter two of Oliver Twist or whatever. You kind of see how that plays out? And so then ultimately when the novels you know, are printed, they can take all of those chapters, all of those serials that they had and put them together. And you know, printing press has been out for a while now. And you know, the population was mostly literate at this time. Um, and so reading and the novels was a way to, uh, to help educate. Um, if you look there at the bottom, that uh, a lot of the plots, they partially depended on romance, but also they included riots among workers and meetings to discuss working conditions. Victorian novels proved to be powerful instruments
for instructing middle class readers because if a novel is laying around, people can read them up and you know they can soak in all of this you know angst and and be educated on the situation. Even if they're fictional, um, they can take some of that stuff and apply it to their life. Okay, um, so the novel was huge. Nine eighteen. Uh, big idea three: the disillusionment and darker visions. Um, as we'll see with some of our content towards the end, it starts to get a darker tone. Um, uh, you know, uh, you have a pessimist and optimist and so on. The pessimism is, you know, kind of negative and so on. And we see it change in some of the last literature that we cover in this unit. Um, darker, the horizon is darkening, and and who knows what's what's coming. And, and it's not really positive and light like you would think with it being the golden age and everything. Um, some people, and we can make this argument that you know the challenge to religion. Okay, that's a big blow. That evolution and creationism. That's that's a big blow um, to it. And that those individuals that live their life believing this one thing or preaching it and all of a sudden people are publicly questioning your beliefs. I mean that, wow, where is the society going? You can see that that would probably paint a dark picture for, for the upcoming years. Um, and, and we will definitely see some uh, representations of that. Um, not spending too much time talking about the naturalism authors, um, naturalistic novels, things that it's not necessarily that significant um, to what we talk about in this class. But just the presence of, uh, of mind to see that the authors are changing what influences them and how they produce writing as opposed to just throwing something out there. Remember they, you know, we got to uh, sonnets and metaphysical poetry, metaphysicals. They remember they were the ones who were, you know, kind of the radicals. Here we have different things motivating these particular writers in this time period. Um, so pay particular attention to, uh, to what pushes those naturalistic novels as well as the decadent literature and so on. Okay, um, so just a lot of information in this particular. I spent more time talking about this than I have in a couple of the recent ones, just because this is I call it their golden age. Th this is the height. Okay, and just like any movie or any book, um, you want to see where they are at their peak, at their apex, because when they fall, we know nowadays where England is. But wait a minute, Alzheimer, you're saying that they were up here. Well, what happened? Well. That's it. That's the tragedy. Macbeth, if we just found out what happened at the end, that's not very tragic. But seeing how great he was and how everybody thought so highly of him, we saw the fall. And that's the story. And that's why it's memorable. Um, so we needed to make sure we understand this. Okay?